Norse mythology, am I right? I'd put it up at number two in terms of how much it's studied in the modern day. After Greek mythology, obviously. It's important to remember that despite how ubiquitous a lot of ancient myths and legends seem, how much we know about these mythologies, and often by extension the culture they stem from, is entirely dependent on how many of their old stories actually survived. Now, in the case of the Greeks, we know so much about them because they wrote basically everything down, and their poets and playwrights spent centuries writing and rewriting classic myths that had up until that point been passed down exclusively through oral tradition. This resulted in what was admittedly a lot of contradictory ideas and characterization, but also an abundance of references for a mythology that would have otherwise likely been lost to history. Similarly, almost all of our knowledge of Old Norse mythology comes from the Codex Regius, a mysterious ancient manuscript that first appears in the history books in the mid-1600s. It's thought to have been written about 400 years prior, although beyond that its origins are almost totally unknown, and several pages of the manuscript vanished mysteriously in the intervening centuries. Man, forget the Da Vinci Code, where's my modern urban fantasy mystery novel about this book? Anyway, today's topic, the Poetic Edda, consists mostly of poetry from the Codex Regius, and it's pretty much the number one source of all modern knowledge of Norse mythology, closely followed by its non-rhyming counterpart, the Prose Edda. Now, it's structured like most collections of myths, in that it's a colossal mess of short stories, most of which have little to no connection to any of the others. So in this video, we'll focus on the most important, interesting, or bizarrely culturally representative of the stories found in it. Oh, and before we get started, do me a favor and leave your Marvel-based assumptions about the Norse deities by the door right there. Yeah, thanks. Just to confirm, Odin's not a neglectful father, Loki's not a misunderstood puppy dog, and Thor is not a chick. Before we go any farther, I'd like to apologize profusely for my complete inability to pronounce Icelandic words. With that in mind, this is the Völspa. So the v... v is the Norse creation myth, and let me tell you, it's kind of surreal. Yes, even by creation myth standards. Basically, in the beginning, there was this big old giant named Ymir, and a big empty space called the Ginnungagap. Then along came the sons of Bor, Odin, Vili, and Ve, who killed Ymir and used his body to make Midgard. Then all the Aesir got together, because apparently there were other gods at this point, and they had a big old party, which was then interrupted when the Norns showed up and told them to get back to work making the dwarves. What follows is seven stanzas of dwarf names, several of which sound suspiciously familiar. Tolkien, you hack! So then Odin and a couple of his pals went out and made all the humans, elves, dwarves, etc. Although in the later story, Heimdall is credited to being responsible for that. Meanwhile, Yggdrasil, the world tree, was being grown by the Norns, who hung out under its roots and controlled the fates of men and gods alike. Huh, that's sounding a little panhellenic. Weird. Anyway, then a war happened between the Aesir and the Vanir, who were like the Aesir but prettier, and Asgard got a little destroyed, so the gods commissioned a giant to rebuild it. However, the giant asked to be paid in the sun, the moon, and the goddess Freya as his wife, and because the gods really didn't want to pay that price, and who can blame them, they got Loki to do his thing and disrupt the construction so the giant couldn't finish in the time given. The giant got pretty pissed about this and threatened the Aesir, at which point Thor did his thing and hit the problem super hard. This handily sets the characterization for our two most prominent deities. Now that's where the creation myth basically ends, and the narrator for the... the Versh, but... Hmm starts talking about the overall structure of the world and the way things work, which, while super cool, isn't super relevant, so we'll skip it. She ties up the story with a description of the future end of the world, Ragnarok, and how after the world ends a new one will arise from the ashes. Fun! So Odin wants to find this super smart giant named Vafthrothnir and challenge him to a battle of wits. His wife Frigg thinks this is a bad idea since Vafthrothnir is like super smart, but Odin is having none of this forethought business and goes off to find him. So Vafthrothnir is like, Welcome to my humble abode. Unless you're smarter than me, you'll never leave here alive. And Odin's like, Neato. My name's Gagnarath. Got anything to drink? Uh, here's an important side note. Odin, as king of the gods, is often compared to Zeus, Jove, and God with a capital G just by virtue of being the top Iser in charge. But Odin's actually much more of a loner and a trickster archetype than any of the other head gods, a detail which is easy to overlook when put in context of that comparison. Odin goes out and quests for knowledge a lot because he's kind of a huge nerd, and to help facilitate his journeys, he routinely disguises himself as conspicuously not Odin. This puts people off their guard and lets Odin get all their delicious knowledge without them freaking out. So anyway, Odin and Vathrothnir have a riddle competition to determine which one is smarter, in which Vathrothnir quizzes not Odin on trivia about how the world works. Surprising precisely no one but Vathrothnir, not Odin is amazingly well read about that sort of thing, being directly responsible for most of it. And somewhere along the line, Vathrothnir decides to bet his life on the outcome of the riddle match, always a good decision, but then not Odin, for his final riddle, asks him a question which has tormented researchers for centuries. What did Odin whisper into Baldur's ear when they held his funeral? Which you might note is something only Odin would know, since Baldur was super dead at the time. More on that later. Anyway, Vathrothnir puts two and two together and figures out he was matching wits with Odin, the literal god of knowledge. Way to go, smart guy. <laughs> So in keeping with the pattern of behavior set by the previous poem, Odin's tendency to disguise himself as a harmless mortal has gotten him into a spot of trouble. Basically, Odin and his wife Frigg were comparing favorite mortals, and Odin's like, My guy Gareth is doing great, dude, he's a king! And Frigg is like, Uh, dude, Gareth tortures his guests if they look at him funny. And Odin's like, What? Come on, man, there's no way. Look, I'll prove it. And disguises himself as a mortal and pops down to hang out with Gareth, whereupon he is promptly imprisoned and tortured. Well, to be fair, it's partly Frigg's fault, since in an effort to win the bet, she sent a servant down to warn Gareth that an immensely powerful mage was going to be stopping 
swing by to bewitch him and told him how to identify this potential threat. Man, Norse gods do not play fair. So anyway, Odin is understandably rather pissed, but there is a silver lining. Gareth's son, Agnar, has been stopping by to give him water, and in return Odin's been telling him stories about how the world works. The rest of the story is mostly a retread of the initial creation myth, up to the end, where Odin decides the time has come to reveal himself in all his glory, possibly originating the hero lists their many names and titles trope in the process, and Gareth trips and falls onto his sword like an idiot. Odin vanishes, presumably to apologize to Freyg and then go find some aloe vera, and Agnar becomes king and rules for many years. <laughs> So one day, Freyr, twin brother to Freya and god of happy sunshine and fertility, is minding his own business surveying the worlds. Hey, isn't that Heimdall's job? When he spots an absolutely gorgeous giantess off in Jotunheim, Freyr is immediately lovestruck and sends his servant Skirner to try and win her over, giving him a neat horse and magic sword. So Skirner rides over to Jotunheim, and Girth, the hot giantess from earlier, lets him into her house, where he offers her 11 gold apples if she'll marry Freyr. Girth refuses, so Skirner adds a magic self-duplicating ring to the offer. Girth is still unimpressed, so Skirner threatens to kill her instead. Girth is having none of that, so Skirner resorts to casting a curse on her that will only manifest if she doesn't marry Freyr. Girth's like, ugh, fine, and promises to meet up with Freyr in nine days' time. She and Freyr get their happily ever after and life is good. It's relevant to note that different versions of this story exclude the threats to Girth's well-being, so if you'd prefer to imagine that there's no creepy element to the romance, that's totally an option. <laughs> So Thor is on his way back to Asgard after some shenanigans in Jotunheim, but I guess he left his magic goat-drawn chariot at home since for some reason he's walking the whole way. Anyway, he encounters a turbulent river which presents an unreasonably insurmountable obstacle, but luckily for Thor, there's a ferryman with a boat. But this ferryman takes an unreasonable disliking to Thor and starts taunting him mercilessly, saying that Thor dresses poorly and also his mom is dead. Thor's like, oh yeah? Well, do you even know how many furious battles I've fought with the Jotuns? A lot. That do anything for you? And the ferryman's like, oh, I'm sorry. I probably didn't notice because I was busy getting laid the whole time. That's pretty much indicative of the overall quality of argument through the rest of the story, and eventually the ferryman just tells Thor to go around the river. It's all very surreal. <laughs> So the Eyes are all having a party in Iger's house one day. Iger, by the way, is some friendly ocean Jotun who apparently throws some pretty wild parties. So the Eyes are suggest that they party it up at his place more often, and Iger agrees on one condition. They have to get him a kettle that's big enough so that he can warm up enough ale for all of them at once. So Thor and Tyr go on a quest together to find a big enough kettle, because the Norse gods had their priorities in order, and Tyr suggests that they get the huge kettle from his dad, who apparently owns one that's a mile deep. How much do these guys drink? Right, stupid question, never mind. Anyway, so they go to Tyr's dad, Hymir, who serves them dinner and offers to let them spend the night. Thor, like all hot headed protagonists, has an enormous appetite and eats so much that they have to go fishing the next day for dinner, during which Thor accidentally fishes up Jormungand, the Midgard serpent, possibly nearly destroying the world in the process. Whoops. Anyway, Hymir's like, all right, kid, you're pretty strong, but can you break this glass? And Thor's like, uh, probably. But the glass proves to be intriguingly indestructible, and Hymir's like, oh no, what a shame, looks like you're not that strong after all. But Hymir's wife is like, psst, kid. Chuck it at his head. And Thor's like, why not? And curveballs the glass into Hymir's skull, whereupon it promptly shatters. Hymir's like, ah, Christ, fine, you're strong, just take the stupid kettle and go. So they do, but first they're attacked by a horde of giants, which they beat because, obviously. <laughs> So the Marvel comics and movies have kind of misrepresented Mjolnir, I'm afraid. It's not that only Thor or someone equally worthy can pick it up. It's more like it's so horrifyingly powerful and destructive that only Thor or someone of his caliber is capable of even holding it without disintegrating or something. So imagine how upset Thor is when he wakes up one day, looks under his bed, and finds Mjolnir has gone missing. Of course, he initially blames Loki, because obviously. But Loki insists it wasn't him. So Loki, under threat of getting the crap kicked out of him, borrows Freya's feather cloak, which lets him fly, and flies over to Jotunheim to look for the missing hammer. There he finds the Thrym, the king of the frog, Giants has stolen Mjolnir and won't give it back unless he gets to marry Freya. Freya, of course, is having none of this, so the eyes are all get together to try and formulate a plan that doesn't involve Freya canoodling around with a frost giant. Hilariously, the final plan they settle on isn't Loki's idea. It's Heimdall's of all people. Heimdall proposes that the best strategy is to dress up Thor all pretty like and pass him off as Freya. Amazingly, this plan is okayed by everyone, so they get Thor dolled up all fancy, and Thor and Loki drive off to Jotunheim, with Loki posing as his lovely maidservant. So Thrym is, of course, overjoyed to have Freya as his bride and throws a huge party while Loki tries desperately to explain away why the most beautiful and refined of all the goddesses is drinking an ocean's worth of mead, growling with rage whenever Thrym looks at her, and absolutely rocking an enormous beard. So eventually Thrym's like, hey Freya, wanna see Thor's hammer? And Thor's like, hell yeah! <coughs> yes darling! And Thrym's like, great, here you go! And Thor immediately kills every last one of them. So here's one important thing to note about Loki. He's a pretty fun guy, you know, a trickster archetype, a shapeshifter, and nowhere near as cute as Tom Hiddleston will have you believe. This is one of the better known stories about Loki, and could also be considered one of the last, since this is basically the one where he takes the joke way too far. Versions of the story vary, but the one that I personally prefer, because in my opinion it makes a little more sense, is the one that incorporates consequences from a different myth entirely, such that Loki receives the punishment that he does not just for mercilessly insulting the Iser, but also because he confessed to his part in the death of Baldur. Now you may remember this isn't the first time we've brought up Baldur 
Baldur's death. It was referenced as early as the second poem we looked at. And that's because it's kind of a big deal, and actually could be considered one of the biggest in the whole mythology. So before I tell you this story, I have to tell you that one. <laughs> So basically, Baldur was the golden boy Asgardian among the Iser, god of pretty much everything good. Love, peace, justice, forgiveness, purity, light, all that good stuff. He was Thor's little brother, and pretty much everybody loved him. However, Baldur started getting prophetic dreams, telling him that he was going to die, which kind of bummed him out. So his mother, Frigg, tracked down every single thing on the face of the Nine Realms, and made them personally promise her that they wouldn't do anything to hurt Baldur. Everything except for harmless mistletoe, which was apparently too young to sign legally binding contracts. So as a consequence to this, Baldur became pretty much indestructible, which all the other Iser thought was awesome, because that way they could throw all the dangerous weapons weaponry they wanted at him with absolutely no negative consequences. It's the ultimate party game! Play it with your friends! Anyway, Loki, god of ruining things for everyone else, decided it'd be super funny if he straight up killed Baldur with the one thing that could still do it, mistletoe. So he made a spear out of mistletoe, handed it to Baldur's blind twin brother Hodor, and watched the fireworks. So Baldur died of mistletoe poisoning and also a spear to the chest, but Hel, goddess of the underworld, also named Hel, was willing to bring him back if everything, alive or dead, wept for him. Now how could Loki pass up such a golden opportunity to ruin everything again? So Baldur had to stay dead, but don't feel too bad. Apparently he's destined to return to life after Ragnarok and become the lone god of the new world. Wait a minute, one god? Ruling a new world with only two humans in it? And the god is a god of light, purity, and literally all that is good in the world? And also he died one time? I have a sneaking suspicion someone tried to wrangle Christian monotheism out of Norse mythology. Anyway, Loki is basically single-handedly responsible for Baldur's death, but he did the whole thing all sneaky-like so nobody explicitly knows it's his fault. Keep that in mind when he decides that confessing to murder is a hoot at parties. <laughs> So the Izer are having a party, because they literally never do anything else, and Loki gets pissed and kills one of Iger's servants, so the Izer are like, Loki, if you're gonna be like that, you're uninvited. And Loki's like, fine, who even needs your stupid party? And goes out into the woods to sulk. But then he decides the party is just asking for a ruinin', so he invites himself back in and gets himself a seat by calling in a favor from Odin. Since they're blood brothers, yet another thing Marvel got wrong, they're obligated to have a drink together. So Loki sets himself down and toasts every god. Except for Bragi, because f poetry, am I right? And Bragi's like, Loki, can we not do this? I'll literally give you my worldly possessions if you don't do this. And Loki He's like, that sounds like something a poor person would say. Also, you suck at fighting. This pretty much continues on in the same vein, with Loki roasting any Izer who has the misfortune of talking to him. Although he basically just spews random insults with no regard for basis in reality, which is very bad roasting etiquette. So then Thor shows up, having been delayed by probably giants, and threatens to knock Loki's head off if he continues with the roasting. And Loki's like, man, can none of you take a joke? It's not like I killed Balder or something. Oh, wait. So Loki skedaddles and shapeshifts into a salmon to hide from the enraged Izer, but unfortunately for him, Odin, being a literal god of knowledge, doesn't have any trouble locating him, at which point they capture Loki, tie him to a rock with the entrails of one of his sons, and stick a venomous snake over him that drips poison into his eyes. Man, the Izer do not mess around. So Loki's wife holds a bowl over him so the venom accumulates in that instead of hitting him in the eyes all the time, but sometimes she has to go empty it out, and when that happens, Loki temporarily loses his eyes. And that, kids, is why earthquakes happen. Alright, so this part of the video is a little unconventional. See, this video was actually sponsored. <gasps> I know, right? What is this, professionalism? Anyway, this video was brought to you in part by Alexander Patterson, who's just written a book called Choices, which is a young adult fantasy novel set in Norway a thousand years ago. It's heavily inspired by Norse mythology, and calls on a lot of the legends, the gods, the Norns, all that jazz. Now, as you may have noticed, Norse mythology is filled with godly shenanigans, great warriors, and acts of heroism of varying degrees. Choices has none of these, largely because nearly all the gods are dead, and our protagonist, Richard, is about as far from a classical great hero as you can get. Just about the only thing going for him is that he's got this cool dragon that one of the last surviving gods gave him, and Richard didn't even do that part heroically, because he straight up ditched the god and ran off with the dragon without even stopping to say thank you. Our protagonist, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, to be fair, I'd do the same thing, but that's hardly the point. So, if you like subverted tropes, Norse mythology, quasi-heroes, and or dragons, give it a look. In conclusion, Alex Patterson. Choices. He has a blog. Thank you for your time.